Well, good evening once again, everybody. My name is Brahmacharya Ditya, and uh, I'm from Ananda Sangha, Pune. But this evening, I'm speaking from Chandigarh, you might say, our men's monastery is situated over here. And uh, I am visiting today. I flew in this morning. It's a really wonderful feeling to be in a different place. And uh, each place just has such a different, unique, uh, but wonderful consciousness. I don't know, I yet have to confirm what are the hills around Chandigarh. But these beautiful, very old hills. And one of our friends, I think they, they were saying they're the beginning of Shivaliks. And, uh, but I was just looking at them, they so old and ancient. I myself come from Rajasthan, where I have seen the Arauli said to be the oldest mountain range in the world. That sometimes you look at, uh, you know, some of these really, uh, you know, old places. And uh, one of our friends was saying that uh, certain parts over there, these are, those are protected hills because they're now so small that any illegal activity could basically, they could <laughs> vanish, you know, very quickly. But you look at them and there is such an antiquity over there. There's just such a sense that nothing has moved over there, actually. And that little bit, you might say, ties into our topic also today, which we're going to talk about, of course, Lord Shiva, the significance of Shivaratri. There's so much symbolism over there, this, which is wonderful, you know, because this is how sometimes the teachings continue. Paramhans Yogananda Ji said that very few people know that the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, Omar Khayyam was a Persian poet, saint actually, but he's often known as a poet and that the Rubaiyat is thought of as a love poem of human love. Kriyananda Ji was told by Paramhans Yogananda that actually it is a scripture of the highest order because Omar Khayyam was a great master and he was writing about the love between a soul and God, the beloved over there, you might say. But it was hidden in such a way that it survived over the centuries. And whenever somebody has had, you might say, as Yogananda Ji had, the intuition, then we are able to go deep over there. And there comes this moment, aha, so this is what this is about. But again, one of the benefits of it having in a story form, in a poetic form, and let's say today of Shivaratri is that uh, uh, even a little child can draw a little drawing of that or narrate that story and feel very happy about it. There's almost like a superhero, you might say, quality that it rouses in your heart because it is truth, which is a little bit, you might say, covered in different, you might say, layers. So ultimately, one does feel the truth. And of course, what to speak of a yogi like the masters, Paramahansa Yogananda Jin, others who express what is the hidden meaning? And then you and I get to say, aha, so what? that's what it is about. So on one level, when I was saying that you look at those beautiful hills and they are so still, so unmoving, well, the same state can be attained in meditation. And Paramahansa Yogananda Ji said in deep meditation, and today on the day of Shivaratri, on this coming night of Shivaratri, try to meditate, try to call upon that presence. Like I said in the beginning, like a child to the mother. Oh, mother, my age is only so much. I don't know how to even speak the words that grown-ups speak. But perhaps you could teach me. And when we pray to the masters that way with sincerity uh, and, you know, really wanting to know, there does come grace. Again and again in the book Autobiography of a Yogi, Paramahansa Yogananda Ji would share the stories for us all that he went to Dakshineshwar temple or to another saint's place. And he said, I would sit to meditate. And then hours would go by, sometimes in the hot sun or just waiting in the cold parlor <laughs> at the Tiger Swami's place or at different places. And he said, then suddenly it's like, like a little thief, like it says in the Bible, God steals upon us. And tonight is an opportunity like that. Well, all the time, the opportunity is there. But special days like today help us focus, renew our understanding, renew our practices, renew our commitment that, okay, um, I'm going in that direction, but today I could renew it further. So when we think of, let's say, you know, uh, Shivaratri, when we think of Lord Shiva, what comes to mind? Well, first of all, the grand image of the king of ascetics, the king of renunciates, the king of yogis, as he is known, that there he is in a you know leopard cloth little bit, 
around his waist. He's got the Trishul, the trident. He's got the moon on top of his head. And he's so austere. He's braving the icy winds without a grimace. He's perfectly at home, right at the top of the Himalayas and uh, wants nothing for himself, is only there to grant others a gift, a boon, a blessing. And there's almost like this power emanating from him, which draws us to that image. And countless expressions of that image have been drawn, or you might say of that ideal, that one by one we piece together. I remember as a little boy, I used to enjoy, once I saw Hanuman on screen in the Ramayana and a few pictures, I said, you know, I'll make my own Hanuman. And to my liking, I would then make his muscles in a certain way. And then, oh yeah, this is good on, I could make it better. And then I would make it. So what, what's really happening in these images, you might say, is our own higher aspiration is finding an expression. And then you look at that image and you say, wow, isn't this Shiva so great? Isn't this Hanumanji so great? Because they come, it's like you forget you created it. You've given it your heart's devotion, aspiration, idealism. And it's almost like that picture becomes real, at least for you. And then to the degree our consciousness has been invested in that, to that degree, somebody else may come along and say, oh my goodness, this is remarkable. I feel a certain quality. I feel a certain power. And from an artist perspective, Swami used to say that actually the consciousness of the artist has gone thinking the energy, the way, the technique you've drawn it with. And he said, it is inevitable that a sensitive observer will pick on that consciousness. Similarly, friends, our universe, Paramahansa Yogarandaji, explained that uh, he said when God had to create this universe, he didn't have things left and right or a hardware store, you might say, Yogarandaji didn't say hardware store, but he didn't have, he didn't go around as you and I would to make a notebook. Let's get the paper, let's get the spiral bound copy and thing, and let's get some ink and let's cut it and here's the notebook. Yogananda said there was nothing he could create it from but himself. So he expressed a part of his consciousness because he is consciousness. He expressed and projected a little part of his consciousness. And then the scriptures, now again, different religions, scriptures, masters may express it differently because the languages are different. The timing at which they come is different. The understanding of people is different. And so they cloak it in different forms of stories, names and such symbolism you might say but ultimately at the heart they are all speaking of the one and the same thing so in this case swami used to say for example consider the om you know in hinduism or sanatana dharma we say om vibration he said well that is the amen of christianity it is the amin in the islamic tradition it is the ahunawar in the zoroastrian tradition and so forth and it's beautiful, actually, if you look up these different, how their different religions express these teachings. Ultimately, you see that the way they're expressing it or when the saints of these particular, let's say, understandings describe their experience, you say they are all pretty much describing something very similar, even though outwardly at the surface, it looks different. Similarly, when creation is formed by God, that movement out of his unmoving spirit sets a vibration about and that vibration is called Om. It can be heard in deep meditation. There is a technique called Om technique which I urge all of you to try to learn after a few months of practice. Uh, we share that technique as part of our teachings and Yogarandaji would say that the very fact that you can hear the Om sound, not just say it, there is significance to saying it properly, but it cannot be spoken of properly, that, which is why there are different names. But when we hear it and commune with it, absorb ourselves, Yogananda said, to the degree you commune and become one with that sound, he said, to that degree, you will simply understand that, of course, the universe was created by a divine power because I'm communing with it. I can hear it. I can, what else is it? It's almost like an intuitive understanding. So from that perspective, 
creation or you might say om which is vibrating in creation the vibration of creation has three aspects it has the brahma the vishnu and the shiva aspect that anything which has come into manifestation first of all the very act of coming into manifestation is said to be the creative side it is called in again our the uh, teachings you might say of sanatan dharma or the way yogananda ji explained is it let's call it is it's called the brahma energy that it's beginning vishnu is the preservation of whatever is created and shiva is the destroyer the destruction now often we think oh you know and some <laughs> of late modern depictions of shiva is all about anger destruction well what is he really destroying ultimately he is destroying even the understanding that anything in creation is going to give us happiness because god set creation into motion he gave you and me a unique individuality through the ego through a sense of i we relate to the world that way we see initially separation or oh, this is separate from me i am separate when i serve somebody i feel closer to them when i love somebody i feel closer to them when i love god i feel closer to him so we are in this world of you might say relativities and in the beginning it is like that but as we get closer and closer to that truth yogananda ji said that when that delusion is destroyed as we were saying om namah shivaya om namah shivaya to guru to god to divine mother that mother you know enough of separation now tonight break that down and one direct technique as i was telling you is the om technique through which we can hear and we say oh i feel so close now you may say i feel close to the spirit of lord shiva because tonight particularly like there are many beautiful wonderful you might say dedications throughout the calendar year to this particular god that aspect of god and tonight we are saying take us back beyond creation destroy all separation destroy this delusion of space and time and bring me back to you through a step by step process which is the way of a yogi now paramhansa yogananda ji also explained over here friends that let's say when we are meditating when this these three phases are going on the brahma the vishnu and shiva he said how do you uh, you know relate to that let's say when it comes in the form of an aspect of you know lord shiva he says well it's wonderful when you think of that image like i was saying it may come in your dream it may actually through your devotion it may come to you in a vision paramhans yogananda ji's guru swami shri yukteswar he said god in order to encourage and express his love for all of his children in creation he said he uniquely comes to each one in the form that is dear to them so you can place that little you might say demand upon god think of in christianity how many different times the virgin mary you know has come across in people's children's visions the visions of saints and swami used to say it's very interesting that each time she comes and again similarly in the hindu tradition whether it's a vision of vishnu some saint has had or of shiva or brahma that you always they always describe it slightly different it's almost like a unique flavor for example the virgin mary may come in the choice of your clothing or like recently somebody said to me that swami kirananda came in their dream and he was speaking in hindi well swami ji didn't he knew hindi but long ago and towards the end of his life it, which is when this person met swami he hardly spoke hindi but in the dream because this devotee knew only hindi he was speaking in fluent hindi and he was adopting the customs of their place and the clothing was like that and it's amazing another time swami had come to somebody in a vision and it was a totally it's more like a folk uh, you know he was coming out of a folklore and when this person got a chance to meet swami he said sir you know you came in my dream and there was a little ritual about these things uh, swami do you, what does that mean that dream swami said it's a true dream i accept that dream in that in the or the reality of that dream because in that dream swami gave this person earrings and actually in that tradition when your guru your teacher puts earrings on you it's an initiation so it's amazing how which is why again the symbolism does not capture it if we just stay on the surface level maybe we'll say okay it's about earrings it is about uh, some love from one person to another 
but then it goes much deeper than that. So master said that when you have devotion to that form, you can pray to that form. Like I was saying, you draw a picture and you can go closer, but it is very important for us to understand what that form stands for really, because then like Totapuri, the guru of Ramakrishna Paramhansa said, he said, what do you see over here? He said, Kali. And he said, meditate more. What do you see? He said, I see the image of Kali. And he said, go beyond that form into infinity. He said, wherever I see, I see only Kali. And then Totapuri picked a piece of glass and crushed it into the forehead of Ramakrishna. He said, go beyond that form. And he went beyond the form by deep concentration right away. And he said, oh, I see, I feel her everywhere. I feel joy everywhere. I feel one with infinite consciousness that ultimately, remember, God who is infinite created him, himself into creation. In that creation, it's wonderful to have an uplifting image. It's wonderful to have an uplifting story, a thought. But ultimately, the to stop over there is to limit the infinite Lord and through meditation, particularly, let's say in this case, through the own technique and other practices that your guru gives you or you, know, you find helpful to yourself, you slowly, slowly start going back in the direction where the truth was expressed in the form of a, you might say, story, in the form of a myth, in the form of a, uh, you know, some a reality which, which has become real. But again, there is much more behind that form. Now, when we think of Shiva, we could think of him in so many ways, like I was saying. Swami Kedandaji said, well, you can think of Shiva the form. But he said, why is he, for example, depicted in the Himalayas, high up in the mountains? Yes, it's always the Himalayas, the highest mountains in the world are a wonderful place to meditate. Many yogis have made that their home, sometimes permanently so. But Swami says the reason is that Shiva is ultimately that aspect is in you. You can become that. And especially when you see yourself from that high altar, you might say, or from that high uh, consciousness that you need to re-establish once again in yourself. Then he says that is the reason why the height of those mountains are given. When you see that little moon, with sliver of a moon, that signifies many things. It signifies a very minimal ego. It also signifies high-mindedness, that his mind, his thoughts are always high-minded and very, very refined. And then when we think of Shiva, you might say through the Om technique, as Yogananda's explained, and I can't go in the detail of it right now, Yogananda Ji said, hear it in your right ear. Then you hear it in your brain, your spine. Then he said, in every cell of your body, then beyond body, Till he said you enter Om Samadhi where you are hearing Om in your inner ear and you are absorbed in Om and you hear it everywhere. That means to be with, you might say, Lord Shiva or to be in the state of, you know, that high consciousness everywhere. So that is like seeing Shiva in infinity in all of it. So I hope on this beautiful day of Mahashivaratri and I would urge you friends to read this beautiful book the Hindu way of awakening, this chapter on, you know, the Om technique and uh, is described, not the technique so much, but the, the philosophy of it. And of course, like I said, the technique can be learned. But again, for example, Swami said that the trident he has, he said it is the Ida, symbolic of the Ida, the Pingala and the Sushumna Nadi, the three nerve channels in which we feel the flow of energy. And let me close with this story of Shiva, which is again very loved. All stories of them are so heroic. So the winning of, you know, bad, good over, you know, bad. And uh, the shining of the light, once again, the destruction of evil over there. That it's very inspiring to hear any of those stories. And similarly, Swami would say that when we are thinking of establishing those qualities in ourselves, let's say think of in that own vibration. He said, how should you act? He said, be very creative. If you're stuck with a problem, what's the solution over here? How can I overcome this? Because there is, remember, creation itself is an act of, you might say, you know, overcoming something, becoming something. So we need to have that quality. Well, when it comes to certain principles, we should have that 
you know, ability to preserve them just the way they were given to us. And that quality also shines in us. And finally, anytime we see that there is a, you know, something which is undesirable, which is keeping us in delusion, prompt action, Swami says, to destroy that delusion before it gets too big. So let me share with you this story in which at one point the problem got too big and then what was the solution? Let us see. Well, this story is of, a, of Shiva, Parvati, his consort, but then of their lesser known child called Andhakasur. And uh, the story goes as many mythological stories start. They are almost hard to believe in, you might say, in the scientific way or uh, in the realm of grown-ups. But you will see the deep symbolism in the simplicity and childlike nature of the story. They say that one, one day, uh, Parvati just put her hands over the eyes of Shiva. And suddenly there was darkness everywhere. All of creation fell into darkness. And in that moment of darkness, by the sweat of her hands, uh, as she put her hands on his eyes, a child was born to them. And because he was born in darkness, they named him Andhak. And, uh, but then they quickly realized they didn't want this child. And they're like, what do we do? And so Shiva looked around and sure enough, there was somebody praying to him and the person was praying for a child. And this was a demon king. So Shiva took this child and he granted the boon to the demon king. He said, why don't you keep this child? And very happily right away, the demon king accepted him and he started taking care of this child and you know, uh, the child started growing. Well, this child quickly, very quickly started growing into a very powerful demon. He was the child of Shiva and Parvati. He was being brought up by a demon king and his tendencies were not very desirable. As he gained more power, he started creating more havoc, difficulties for people. And as would happen in these mythological stories, all the gods one day went to Vishnu. And they said, something has to be done. This child, Andhakasur, who is now grown up, this demon has to be stopped. And Vishnu said, well, <clears throat> he's not my child. It's not my responsibility. You have to go to Shiva. Sure enough, they went to Shiva and Shiva said, I'll stop him. And so he challenged him to, you know, a duel, you might say. <laughs> and as they were fighting, Shiva realized at one point that he's quite powerful. So he thought, this is it. Let me finally kill him. So he took his trident and he struck Atakasur. Much to everybody's surprise and including Shiva's own Everybody who was observing, they saw wherever drops of blood were falling, one more Andhakasur was coming up, one more was coming up, one more was coming up. And seeing this, Vishnu was also observing. So the next time Shiva struck Andhakasur, as the blood was falling, Vishnu allowed it not to fall on the ground and collected it, they say. And then... Shiva took Andhakasur and they say he lifted him up on the trident and kept him up there <laughs> for a thousand years. And after a thousand years, the stories say that Andhakasur apologized, his arrogance went away, he realized his mistakes, he became very weak and he asked for forgiveness. And actually some stories, some versions say he became so sattvic that actually he was turned into a god. And so the story ends. There are different variations, but this is the simplistic one. Now you may say, what a wonderful story. And some temples have depictions of this engraved in rock. So this story has survived millennia. It's right there in the Vedas and Puranas and different, different versions. But friends, from a yogic perspective, let's come back to certain aspects over there. In a moment of darkness, in a moment of ignorance, in a moment of lack of understanding, we who are high-minded, God, Shiva, Parvati, the masculine and feminine side is equally there. The soul is a perfect amalgamation of the two. But in a moment of delusion, while we're on this journey of called life, we may do a bad deed, we may develop a bad habit. Shiva comes along, that habit starts troubling us, it starts troubling others. When we are a bad, in a bad mood, 
we do no service to ourselves we certainly don't do a good service to others like yogananda once said to some kid the no more moods walter otherwise how will you serve others so comes this yogi aspect in our lives the ida pingala the sushumna you might say the trident and we say okay enough of this bad habit the more i engage in it the many fold it becomes one problem has turned into so many now i'm overwhelmed and you say no now god comes to our rescue he is trying to contain the damage and then you say okay i'm going to take this problem and spiritually speaking yogically speaking when you say you lift it up on the trishul and keep it there that stick and those three uh, you know tried the prongs of the trident they symbolize as i said the nerve channels in our spine you keep your focus at the spiritual eye you keep your intention like a yogi your concentration your will your intention your focus your devotion is kept up high in the himalayas you don't have to go there you can be himalayan in your consciousness at this highest point in your body and you keep it there and a thousand years that seems a bit too long for our life span but again in a kriya yoga perspective yogananda ji said if we do our kriyas properly a half a minute kriya equals to one years spiritual evolution of proper normal living outside so that way a thousand years goes by very fast in one meditation or two meditations it can go by and you keep that problem there and that problem starts getting very small till it becomes no problem at all your perspective changes your own habit has now changed you have not fed that habit you have instead brought a different perspective you have redirected the energy you have destroyed that delusion you might say and finally what is left uplifted that energy has been from going down it has now gone up and it's only natural for that demon <laughs> demon you might say to now be made into a saint into a god or whatever you call it so again i invite you today to revisit some of these teachings which have so many beautiful layers like i said from a little child who can be entertained through this to all of us aspiring yogis we can derive lessons from this and let's thank the masters let's thank the saints and sages who have passed on this wonderful you might say treasure of these stories the treasure of the tools and techniques uh, let's thank god for the blessing of such a festival in our lives and let's keep one another in prayer let us again across religions as these practices are done each in their own way like swami says some religions will never accept and it's not their folklore so brahma vishnu shiva it doesn't matter but he said om or amen or ahunava or amin you see those are similar so he says as our consciousness evolves inevitably we will be drawn to commune with this sound as you commune with this sound he says you will understand and like i was singing in that chant jai shiva shankara vam vam hara 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 vam vam hara hara that by communing with this sound of om om i will ultimately find swami said that we all will find uh, the happiness all the happiness of this universe that is the gift these simple practices bring in time god bless you have a wonderful mahashivaratri and let's close with a little chant of om namah shivaya and then we'll do a healing prayer om namah shivaya 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 Om Namah Shivaya